Created by Denny O'Neill and Alan Weiss, The Hunter of Souls first appeared in 1980's Amazing Spider-Man with issue 209. Who is she? Let's talk about Calypso. First, thanks for watching JLS Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into our story. Calypso Azili was born on the Caribbean island of Haiti and grew up surrounded by voodoo magic and practitioners, familiarizing herself with mystical artifacts, rituals, and arcane potions and magic over the years, slowly studying and learning from those around her. Though some practiced for good, Calypso thirsted for power and control and desired the ancestral power those tribal heads on her Caribbean island wielded. Calypso studied intensely, embracing ways of evil, steadily falling down a well of darkness and evil to become a master of spells and potions and rituals, of control of others' minds and souls, control of animals, and even of resurrection. Calypso performed her first ritual, a ceremonial baptism of herself that included a ritual sacrifice, her first kill. As a hunter of souls, Calypso became enthralled with another hunter named Sergi Kravenoff, aka Craven the Hunter, and she lusted for him, and the two became passionate lovers, giving fully into the primal nature of their ardor. But when Craven left, Calypso's lust remained, and so Calypso seduced the gods, drawing their power to become the witch, and for that power, Calypso sacrificed and killed her own sister, her second kill, claiming her first soul. And finally, Calypso had her power fully ensnared and gripped in her passion for evil. And from there, Calypso appeared in 1980's Amazing Spider-Man issue 209, debuting on the splash page right alongside Craven the Hunter, whose love drew them back to each other. The pair were at a retreat somewhere in the Caribbean, surrounded by artifacts, mementos, and trophies from countless hunts and safaris around the globe. Calypso was disappointed in her paramour, Craven, for not continuing his hunt of the Spider-Man. She controlled and manipulated Craven, goading him into going after not mannequins with spears in the safety of his own retreat, but to go after the real Spider-Man once more. Craven refused this, telling Calypso his hate for Spider-Man took years off his life and his hate for Spidey consumed his soul and his honor. And so Calypso said that Craven must feel humiliated after Craven's last encounter in Marvel Team-Up issue 67 where he'd used Tigra and yet was still defeated. This goading of Calypso infuriated Craven, but through that managed to remind Calypso that they had a shipment of animals to deliver to New York. It just so happens that Spider-Man's current girlfriend, Deborah Whitman, had an uncle who owned a shipping line down on the docks. When Peter swung by the docks to check it out, he saw a shipping vessel unloading livestock cargo for the Staten Island Zoo, a veritable Noah's Ark, and as he perched above the activity, he was spotted by a disguised Craven and Calypso. While Craven considered if Spidey saw them or not, Calypso enacted her own plan. She went to the cages and unleashed some of the wild animals, setting them loose in New York City in an attempt to get Craven back to hunting and back to his former self. After the animals were rounded up with Spider-Man actually helping capture an eagle, Calypso lied to Craven, saying that she saw Spider-Man open the cages when it was actually her. Calypso slapped Craven in the face and called him a coward for not going after Spider-Man, and Craven was again enraged, playing right into Calypso's manipulations. Craven said he knew he could beat Spider-Man, but she said he had no way of knowing until he once more met Spider-Man on the field of honor to test himself, to prove he was not a pale shadow of what Craven once was. These words would haunt Craven to his last moments. Craven then stormed into the Daily Bugle while Peter Parker and Rupert Dockery were talking and demanded that they print a challenge to Spider-Man on the next issue's front page. Spider-Man and Craven ended up battling under the cover of darkness at the Museum of Natural History while Calypso watched from the shadows cast by the dim light of the moon. This is my Craven, fierce, ferocious, filled with the joy of the kill, a joy I share, she thought to herself as an evil grin spread across her enshrouded face. But then Craven was defeated, literally punched right into the waiting police. That's when Peter met up with Deborah again and they went to see a psychic named Madame Webb for the first time. Calypso and Craven showed up together again in 1982's Spectacular Spider-Man issue 65. Craven had outfitted a warehouse with a mock-up of New York City and was hurting people as test runs for his spider hunt. All the while, Calypso beat a rhythmic, haunting, and intimidating drumbeat from a nearby balcony. It's where we learn that Craven was able to break both of them out of police custody after their last appearance. He was now more determined than ever to defeat Spider-Man for he needed his honor back. Craven believed without his honor he was unworthy of Calypso's love, though she said he already had her heart. Craven studied Spider-Man for weeks and they set a trap for him in his neighborhood. One day after Peter swung home, Craven saw him and raised his African war axe to the sky, a signal to Calypso who was on another nearby rooftop to play her instrument weapons. Burba bells and a Yoruba spirit drum said to be cloud the mind of an enemy and indeed the mesmerizing drumbeat worked. Spider-Man became disoriented, dulling his spider sense, the percussion perplexing Peter Parker as Craven threw a war axe and a weighted net at Spider-Man. Calypso continued to beat her drums as Craven moved in to beat the Spider-Man. Calypso then tossed Craven a Bantu war club to use against Spider-Man, who narrowly dodged Craven's onslaught of attacks. 
and still diabolical drumbeats beat against the backdrop of battle. Then as Calypso tossed a war whip to Craven, Spider-Man turned his attention to her and her drum, webbing it up and swinging it right out of Calypso's grasp, right off the rooftop. And with that, Parker's spider sense returned and he once more gained the upper hand against Craven. But to help him in a way that would allow him to retain his vanity, Calypso secretly shot a small poison dart laced with herbal hallucinogens into Spider-Man's calf with a queely crossbow. When Spider-Man collapsed, Craven's whip tightly wrapped around Spidey's neck. Calypso came up and put an Anahuac trophy mask on Spider-Man, the symbol of a humbled prey and an honored hunter. But Craven became angry at her when he saw the dart in Spider-Man's leg, knowing he didn't do this himself. That moment allowed Spider-Man to roll off a rooftop and try to escape from the duo, though the hallucinogens played havoc with his mind. When Spider-Man finally collapsed, Craven had caught up with him and so did the police. Clipso, still watching from the rooftops, hurled a massive spear at Spider-Man, wanting to kill him herself, but Craven grabbed the spear in mid-air, saving Spider-Man. Craven wanted to defeat Spider-Man without help, to do it the way he thought was honorable. He was livid and snapped the spear in half, and said, How can you love a failure who needs help to defeat his prey? And then, How can I love a woman who can't understand the meaning of honor and dignity? And with that, she hung her head solemnly and walked away as Craven was arrested by the NYPD. Later on, an AIM agent named Colonel Ramona Starr, posing as Ramona Cortland, broke into the prison where Craven was being held to free him so he'd help her hunt down Kazar the Savage. Craven told Ramona he chose to be incarcerated due to what happened with Calypso in an attempt to maintain his own pride. He did ultimately, however, decide to leave and later, while with Ramona, read a newspaper that declared Calypso had also broken out of prison. He said he'd need to go after Spider-Man again before Calypso interfered, though he did actually go after Kazar, converging on him at the same time as Zabu, Shauna, and Ramona did. Calypso's influence made Craven singularly focused on defeating Spider-Man. Knowing he was getting older and it was his time, he had to do something, so Craven vowed to finally defeat Spidey once and for all, to retain his honor before he passed into the afterlife. And this happened in a story called Craven's Last Hunt, where he captured, drugged, and buried Spider-Man and took over Spidey's life for two weeks before ultimately killing himself. Something he might not have done if the allure of Calypso hadn't been an untoward influence on him. This led to Todd McFarlane's iconic Torment story arc in 1990's new adjectiveless Spider-Man title. And it was there in the darkened sanctuary in New York City, the former home of Craven the Hunter, surrounded by a ritual fire pot, spirit prayers, and unholy ephemera obscura that a ritualistic drumbeat throbbed and pounded its way through a city that never sleeps, beckoning the lizard, Kurt Connor, from his watery depths. These were Calypso's drums and Calypso's magic that called Kurt Connors forth to cut a bloody swath through New York's underworld. Calypso combined a spider, a reptile, and body ashes in a fresh pool of blood mixed with an esoteric incantation that once again played havoc with Peter's spider sense just before he clashed with the lizard in a cold rain and warm, blood-soaked cloak of darkness in nighttime New York. Calypso still controlled the lizard, ordering him to stop just before ripping out Spider-Man's jugular with his sharp teeth, for Calypso wanted Spider-Man to suffer more before he perished. That's when an illusion of Craven showed up, half his face still blown away from the gunshot that he took his own life with. When the spell was broken, the ghostly and ghastly image of Craven gave way to its true form, that of Calypso herself. Calypso gyrated and cackled maniacally, casting her spells and ordered the lizard to lash out at the wounded Spider-Man. Calypso and Lizard brought an unconscious yet bound Spider-Man back to their Upper East Side lair where she splashed him with a crimson concoction there on the floor of her unholy sanctuary. She wanted to control him and to torment him to claim his soul. When the Lizard lunged at the battered Spider-Man again, a fire pot was toppled and the fire hit a ruptured gas line and Calypso's lair exploded in a massive fireball that lit up the night. They didn't die though and Calypso continued to controlling the lizard, her own blood streaming down her face as the life drained from her body but hate and evil kept her alive. An ungodly spirit granted her power and strength to keep up her fight. As poison continued to spread through Spider-Man's body, he mustered strength to snap Lizard's neck with a chain, Lizard's blood pooling at Calypso's feet. Knowing defeat was now imminent, Calypso used her magic to collapse the entire building down upon herself, and Spider-Man seemingly won, but he had no answers, unable to make sense of it all, and with an impending sense that they could strike again at any time, and to those he loved, did Calypso actually win? Did she give Spider-Man his true torment? A torment of rampant speculation of what could be that would whittle away at his sanity. Calypso reared her braided head once more in 1992 during an Infinity War crossover in Daredevil's comic book series. A refugee named Eve Shepato had come to Matt Murdock for help after he escaped Haiti, but Calypso and her zombie named the Nameless One was hunting down Eve and the new Haitian dictator's men were also looking for him. 
Calypso beat her Yoruba spirit drum rhythmically and sent her zombie after her prey. Calypso ran into a demonic daredevil doppelganger and was familiar with the Devil of Hell's Kitchen from the stories Calypso's fallen lover Craven had told her about Daredevil. Calypso battled the Daredevil Hellspawn, calling him Red Man, perhaps inspired by What the Album, which released a couple months prior to this issue. The Hellspawn bit Calypso and fled into the night, but not before she shot it with a dose of Black Sage from a blowgun. This happened while the actual Daredevil fought the Nameless One zombie to protect Chapiteau. The Black Sage had minimal effect on the monster and it bit Calypso, tearing at her flesh. She managed to reach her drum just in time to drive the beast into a fit of confused agony long enough for her to strike a killing blow by ripping one of the doppelganger's horns off and stabbing it repeatedly with its own horn. Calypso took the Hellspawn's blood and by ancient rite of ceremony had the Loa add the monster's power to her own. When the actual Daredevil defeated the Nameless One, the maddened Calypso showed up in a dark alley, declaring herself a hunter of souls, there to collect from the Red Man Daredevil. And as her drum beat once more, the sound of the doom, 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 the backdrop as she poisoned him, and she became a monster, choking Daredevil with someone's intestine, and then forced him to kneel at the altar of Baron Cemetery before Daredevil collapsed to the floor, numb as his heart and lungs slowed to a stop, and he died. Calypso then took Matt Murdock from the morgue and brought his body to her trophy room of the soul she collected, and Calypso sucked out Murdock's remaining life force, capturing it in a pot to tat, and then danced a ritual to summon for the Loa Dambala, mixing her blood with Murdock's, and she transformed Daredevil into her next nameless one, Zombie. Being blind, Murdock couldn't see his pale skin or his lack of shadow, and it was Chapito who told him that he would need to reclaim his soul by attacking Calypso in her Hoonforts, her voodoo temple. Daredevil learned more about zombies by watching Dr. Voodoo on his book tour, explaining Voodoo's religious beliefs in two halves of the soul, as well as the two different types of zombies, evidenced by Felicia Felix Mentor and by Simon Garth. An image of Dr. Voodoo appeared before Matt Murdock and told him that Calypso was a bokor, something like a voodoo mercenary, who'd been paid to capture refugees and return them to Haiti, like Yves Chapiteau, and she was doing this to raise money to bring back one of the truly dead. He told her he must stop this mad mambo, but Calypso butted in saying it was too late, that Daredevil's soul was hers to control, to make him bring her souls of those she needed to kill and carry out her bloodthirsty revenge quest. Daredevil had a moment of mental strength and resisted Calypso long enough to get back some consciousness, and Daredevil realized he was in her temple, hidden beneath the Museum of Natural History, and he managed to escape. Later, as Calypso loaded her prisoners into coffins for transport back to Haiti, Daredevil crashed in and attacked. He managed to hit Calypso in her face with one of his clubs and shatter the pot that held his life force, allowing it to escape, so he reclaimed his own soul once more. Calypso bit Daredevil, so he picked her up high above his head and threw her into a group of other pots, freeing the other spirits of her control, and they all attacked her, overwhelming her and wanting to drag her back to the grave with them. Daredevil then escaped as the museum construction collapsed down upon them, but Daredevil knew that Calypso had a habit of escaping collapsed buildings. And indeed she did, next appearing on the cover of Daredevil's 1993 Annual Number no. 9 where she called forth a gothic terror to destroy Daredevil. This was the Devourer who possessed the body of a museum security guard named Tommy Webster by way of a Mayan Lords of Death artifact called Vision Serpent. In the issue, Calypso headed to New Orleans wanting to resurrect Simon Garth after consecrating his burial site. Papa Doc told Calypso Simon Garth's story, but Papa Doc refused to help, so Calypso stripped and said he could have her body if he agreed. But again, Papa Doc told Calypso no. Instead, by the magic of paradox, Calypso claimed Papa Doc's life and stole the talisman of Dabala from his lifeless body. She sucked his soul and performed the ritual to raise Simon Garth from his marshy grave. She then used Daredevil's stolen blood to raise up the Hellspawn again, except it attacked her and then Simon Garth. Hellspawn ripped Zombie's jaw off while Calypso managed to get a hold of her spirit drum to bring the Hellspawn back under her control for a moment before he threw a dagger which ripped her drum, rendering it useless. Hellspawn fleed while Zombie walked away, and Calypso realized only through acts of love could a zombie retain its free will, but she had kept her love for just one man, so this wouldn't work, that one man being Craven the Hunter. In Web of Spider-Man issue 109, Calypso's path crossed with those of Spider-Man and the Lizard once again. Now Calypso was at a bar in a small town in the Colorado Rockies that happened to be the town that helped serve a supervillain Supermax prison known as the Vault. Calypso seduced a guard named Marty and then made him take her inside the prison where she attacked the guards and amidst the waving clouds of deployed voodoo gas pellets, she killed them and made them shoot each other while Calypso herself broke into the cell of Dr. Kurt Connors, aka the Lizard. Calypso's music and her scent and her primal attraction cut through Connor's therapy and he reverted back to the lizard again, striking Calypso with a powerful blow that was so hard she fell to the ground, immediately dead, while the lizard broke out and left the prison. 
The authorities took the dick Calypso to a morgue, and over her corpse, Warrant was authorized to capture or kill the lizard. Calypso remained dead for three years, and was resurrected in Spider-Man's 1997 annual issue. Glory Grant had just got back from a week-long vacation in the Caribbean, and met up with Peter Parker at the Daily Bugle, where he was meeting with Betty Brandt and Robbie Robertson. Gotta love the classic Stanley alliteration. Glory had taken photos, including some of some refugees that they had encountered, and Spider-Man had just fought with a zombie-like guy, which is why he was at the Bugle, sharing photos from that battle, but the guy turned out to be Glory's cousin Ramon. There were more zombie-like people at Glory's apartment who attacked Parker and Grant, which has been a federal agent named Walker, aka Shotgun, showed up and pumped a few rounds into one guy, saving Parker from exposing his Spider-Man identity. As that was happening, Simon Garth crawled out of the Hudson River, called forth by one artifact. Glory told Walker that she'd gotten a pendant from someone on her trip, which turned out to be the Talisman of Dumbala, the talisman that calls for Simon Garth. That person had told her that Yetta rode across the seas and now needed a new host to complete her journey back to this realm. Glory was becoming more possessed by Calypso and daunted her exegist and rather revealing its higher, and once more a drumbeat throbbed in the night. But it was not the spirit drum, it was Walker's beating heart. The next day, Glory Grant and Walker headed offshore to die of a wreck said to have some illegal mind-altering chemicals aboard, the same type that transformed Glory's cousin to a zombie, and the same one that Craven had used when he stuck Parker in a coffin for two weeks. Below the surface, they pinned Garth to the hull of the vessel, and then Glory injected Walker with the drug. It turns out that she'd gone to Dr. Kafka's office just before they had left shore, now fully under Calypso's control herself, and she freed her cousin from Dr. Kafka's lab and said she needed a body trapped under the water in the wreckage. The Grant Calypso used her zombie to dig up her old body from her gravesite at Cypress Hills Cemetery, and she was about to put the talisman on her corpse to transfer her spirit, but the zombies interfered and fought each other. While they were distracted, the Grant Calypso dragged her original Calypso body away to safety. Spider-Man was forced to get the talisman from Zombie Ramon, and he gave it to the Glory Grant Calypso in order to save Glory, and it worked. Glory was saved, and Calypso, now alive again, managed to escape. Spider-Man then gave the talisman of Dabala back to Simon Garth, he lumbered away to rest. Calypso then reunited with a resurrected Kraven the Hunter awash in a rain that pounded at the night and the cemetery around them. But this Kraven was different, and struck Calypso down that walked away from her. This wasn't Sergi, this was Alexei Kravenoff. Calypso went back to his place, tantalized by what she thought was a game, still believing this was her Kraven. Alexei slept with Calypso, then laughed and told her she sought the father and found the son. He set his tiger, lion, and an ape on her, and she fled, vowing she'd be back. And she did come back, this time with an army of Craven's servants, and attacked Alexei while he was talking with Spider-Man. Calypso threw a potion in Craven Jr.'s face, and then with her knife to his throat, threw more in Spider-Man's face too. She and her army put them both in cages and took them to the Cravenoff estate in upstate New York, putting them on the grounds near Sergi's gravesite. And again, Calypso danced in the rain, a voodoo dance that turned the junior hunter and the Spider-Man into mindless savages under her control, and she forced them to fight each other to the death. In the fight, Spider-Man picked up a spear, drawn to fight, but instead, he threw it at Calypso. It didn't kill her, but it was enough to shut off her control. Calypso tried to escape, but Alexei's lion caught up with her, nearly eating her alive, but he called it off, and Craven grabbed her hand, and they agreed it was time to let the past lie in the past and move on. And so they all departed with an uneasy truce in place. Finally, Calypso had a brief cameo in Tom Taylor's Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man book, where she was part of the Green Goblin's Sinister 60. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.